Assassin's Creed is my favourite franchise of all time, and the main reason for that is the narrative. These characters that were given more depth and realism than I was used to in the medium before playing AC. These philosophies that created deep ideologies that were never one thing or another. They were never good or bad. The lore is so fascinating, expansive, and perfectly connected to real world events. It feels like this world could exist. That these secret wars between Assassins and Templars could have actually happened. With Assassin's Creed Valhalla now just a few weeks away, and the narrative being headed by Darby McDevitt, in my opinion the series' finest writer, being behind Ember's Revelations and Black Flag, I thought, why not go back through every mainline Assassin's Creed title and recap the story so far, since we're in for what's sure to be an excellent narrative. So, without further ado, this is the story of Assassin's Creed. On March 13th, 1987, Desmond Miles was born to a woman we don't really know anything about, and William Miles, a veteran assassin. Desmond was raised in a community called The Farm in the Black Hills of South Dakota. His father trained him to be a part of this group called the Assassins from his very birth, which could be a bit heavy at times. He always warned Desmond of his natural enemies, the Templars, training him to be an assassin just like he was. At age 16, Desmond decided the community was simply insane conspiracy theorists and left for New York City. On the 1st of September 2012, the Templar Daniel Cross commanded Desmond's capture after finding a fingerprint he provided for his motorcycle license. He was taken to an Abstergo facility in Italy and regained consciousness in what would seem like a dream. He was disoriented and surrounded by ancient foreign architecture, some of which was phasing in and out of existence, as well as these weird faceless women, when Desmond hears a voice. I can't anchor him to the memory. Too much psychological trauma. He's rejecting the treatment. Retreating. Desmond, I need you to try and relax. Let me try and stabilize. Focus. Listen to the sound of my voice. Recognize that what you're seeing isn't real. Just a picture of the past. It can't hurt you. Damn it. It's not working. Give it a moment, Miss Tillman. You'll adjust. The first time is never easy. These people are Warren Vidic and Lucy Stillman, both working for a company called Abstergo Industries, a huge conglomerate with hands in the industries of medicine, banking, gaming, tech, and fitness. They have a huge amount of control, which is what the founders Henry Ford and Ransom Olds intended when they created the company in 1937 as a Templar front. But we'll get into them later. In 1983, Abstergo finally developed the first stable animus. The animus is a tool that could be used to record a subject's genetic memories. Genetic memories are effectively the memories of your ancestors that are passed down through your DNA. The Animus allows for a subject to relive these memories, the purpose of this being so that Abstergo could view the memories of people of interest and track down pieces of Eden. Tools created by the ones who came before, the precursor race known as the Isu, who were all but wiped out over 70,000 years ago as a result of a great catastrophe. They take on a form similar to humans, but are very different, having a larger lifespan, brains a third bigger than ours, they're also slightly taller than humans on average, and most importantly, they have the sixth sense knowledge, an ability which allows Isu to look into various possibilities that play out in the future, which does come into play later in the story. To be able to use the animus, Desmond had to synchronise. He had to let go of the initial stress and stop resisting so he could relive the memories of Altier Ibn Ahad as accurately as possible, and that he did, knowing that Abstergo would kill him if he didn't. He emerged in Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, 1191, as Altier Ibn La Ahad, a young, overconfident master assassin hunting for the Apple of Eden. Desmond quickly learned that the assassins weren't just a crazy theory his family had, but a real creed that had lived for millennia. Altier was a Levantine assassin. The Levantine Brotherhood were the assassins at their most disciplined and organised. A group that made peace and freedom their two driving motivations, carrying out assassinations and working in the dark to serve the light. The assassins had three tenets to uphold and enforce their values. Snay or blade from the flesh of an innocent, hide in plain sight, and never compromise the Brotherhood. All three which Altier broke whilst hunting the apple. As punishment for this, his mentor al Walim Rashid ad-Din Sinan sent Altier to kill nine people who were targets to the assassins. Arms merchants, slavers, sadists, both Saracens and Crusaders alike, and they were all connected to the Templars, the natural enemy of the assassins, and a group with a lust for ultimate control. Although both groups strive for the same thing, 
peace. The issue is that the Templars wouldn't allow for the ultimate freedom that the assassins hold so dear, instead opting to enforce peace by ultimate control. And like the assassins, they want the peace of Eden, a device capable of controlling the minds of men. As Altier completed his assassinations, he was humbled and began to question things much more. Each day, as Desmond made more progress, he'd learn more about exactly what was going on by eavesdropping on conversations and hacking Vidic's laptop. Desmond learned that an Abstergo higher-up, Alan Rickin, was watching over Vidic's progress apprehensively, pushing him to make more. As Desmond was reliving Altier's memories, the bleeding effect began to kick in. This was when a subject's memories would begin to bleed together with their ancestors. In a best-case scenario, it would mean the subject could adapt their skills in terms of combat and advanced movement, but in a worst-case scenario, it could result in hallucinations, the subject reliving the memories of their ancestor outside the Animus, and in some cases, the subject would completely disassociate from themselves, something that Desmond was soon to find out about in a rather grisly way. He was making good progress with Altier, and having assassinated those nine Templars, he dealt with Al Mualim, who had been pulling the strings the whole time. He had Altier kill those targets, so he was free, free to use the apple as he wished and control the minds of those around him. Seeing the damage Al Mualim had already caused, Altier killed him, and the apple projected a map showcasing various points across the world where other pieces of Eden or Isu sites were. What was once a crazy theory to Desmond was now a surreal and bizarre reality. With that, Abstergo had what they needed, and Desmond was taken out of the Animus. Alan Rickin discussed the success of the Animus project to Vidic and what exactly they were to do. According to Rickin, all they needed was one piece of Eden. For what exactly, Desmond didn't know. Lucy convinced Vidic not to kill him, as Desmond could still be of some use, and he was left to his own devices knowing his life was in the balance of these men. Having spent so much time with Altier, Desmond could now use Eagle Vision, an ability inside all humans, although only accessible to some. Whether it be for a matter of training the ability, or having a high enough concentration of Isu DNA. Using Eagle Vision, Desmond saw blood all over the room, weird symbols left behind by Subject 16, the subject before him, Clay Kazmarek. Clay was a student of William Miles, Desmond's father, who took him in and taught him the ways of the Assassin Brotherhood. In 2010, he gave Clay the mission of infiltrating Abstergo and getting information about the Animus project from Vidic's computer. Clay was successful in his mission, being able to provide the Assassins with the location of their new facility in Italy, the exact figure of how much money was going into the project, and the identity of its lead, Warren Vidic. After that, the Assassins decided to route Clay even further into Abstergo. This time, he'd be a subject of Vidic himself. William assured him he'd be safe under the supervision of their own inside agent, Lucy Stillman, Warren's assistant. By the Assassins' design, the next year Clay was kidnapped by Abstergo's lineage discovery and acquisition team, a team specialised in finding and capturing subjects with valuable genetic memories. Clay relived the memories of Italian assassin Ezio Auditore, however, for much too long, causing Clay to experience the bleeding effect. Clay soon surmised they were after an Apple of Eden. After asking Vidic about this, he told Clay that if he truly knew what they were after, he couldn't live to tell the tale. William sent him a message assuring him that Lucy wouldn't let any harm come to him, and soon after, Clay found out exactly what the Animus project was and was prepared to leave. As it turned out, this was far far bigger than simply a lust for control. On December 21st, 2012, a solar cataclysm was projected to nearly wipe out all of humanity. Abstergo planned to stop this by launching the Eye of Abstergo, a satellite that paired with an Apple of Eden would not only shield the Earth from the flare, according to their plan, but also control its inhabitants, all under the guise of being used for communications. One launch failed, destroying the piece of Eden that they'd used, hence why Abstergo was scrambling to retrieve the Apple. As a result of the bleeding effect being so severe, Clay spoke to Juno and Isu, one of those who came before. She told him to help the next subject, Desmond Miles, to get a message out to him, the truth. She told Clay of Lucy's true nature, that in her time with Abstergo, away from the assassins, she had joined them, feeling betrayed after spending seven years alone with Abstergo. She was now tasked with helping the assassins retrieve the apple, only to return it to the Templars. Lucy realised Clay knew who she was, and she couldn't let Clay leave now. If the assassins realised who she was, the plan would be foiled. She told Clay that William and the Assassins really didn't care for the lives they destroyed, whereas the Templars did. At this point, it became clear it was all over for Clay. The Templars would use his genetic memories to control the world and eventually kill him. Clay opted for another option and went with Juno's plan. He planned to end his own life, 
but not in vain. During the night, Clay would hack the Animus and implant a construct of himself inside it. He hid glyphs and rifts with various messages across the memories of Ettore Auditore, hoping Subject 17 would get his message. Clay sent one final email to his father and then cut his wrists, scrawling symbols across the lab with his blood. And just so you know, all of these actually mean something. For example, this symbol, featuring an assassin above a triangle full of eyes, represents how the Templars would use the apple to control everybody beneath them. Although to Desmond, this was simply confusing. Confusing. The truth was so close, yet so far. Before he could even begin to comprehend what was happening, Lucy entered the room, covered in blood, telling him he was being saved. Desmond already trusted Lucy. She had previously gestured her alliance to the assassins and had always been sort of warm to him. Totally confused, Desmond was forced to re-enter the Animus and synchronise with Ezio Auditore da Firenze, the same ancestor Clay visited. Desmond watched Ezio's birth to Mario Auditore and her husband, the assassin Giovanni Auditore, a wealthy Florentine banker. But Desmond was quickly pulled out again. Desmond was surprised at Lucy's combat prowess as she dealt with the Abstergo guards who would surely delay their escape. They successfully fought off the guards and Lucy was able to take them to an assassin hideout also in Italy. There they met two assassins, Sean Hastings, an English historian and analyst, and also Rebecca Crane, the assassin who recruited Sean and she was also one of Lucy's old friends whom she hadn't seen for seven years since working for Abstergo. Using information Lucy had sent her, Rebecca had made some slight tweaks to the Animus. The Animus 2.0. This one was more like a chair and allowed for information to be sent from outside the Animus. Sean utilised this by sending various databases to Desmond and also speaking to him while he was in the Animus. Despite the improvements, the bleeding effect was still an issue. However, Lucy told Desmond she planned on utilising it to make Desmond an assassin, learning the skills of his ancestor Ezio Auditore. Going back into the Animus, Ezio wasn't a baby anymore, but a brash, confident and cocky 17 year old, who despite his eagerness for adventure and mystery, Mischief was a man of honour, integrity, and family. However, more important than that was that this Florentine noble was somehow connected to the apple. In his days reliving Ezio's memory, Desmond experienced this child's growth into a wise and capable assassin, whilst also picking up his skills, and most importantly, the truth. Desmond found those symbols Clay left behind, those glyphs, each containing some sort of revelation that revealed the scope of this war to be even bigger than what Desmond already comprehended. After decoding them all, he was left with a recording of one of Clay's genetic memories, two people running through a city so long ago, 70,000 years ago in fact, yet everything looked kind of futuristic. What he was seeing was Adam and Eve escaping Eden, an Isu city with an apple of Eden. And these two people, these two humans, Adam and Eve, would lead the rebellion against the Isu. When Ezio reached the vault under the Sistine Chapel, a place said to house great power, Ezio met Minerva, an Isu scientist who explained to him who she was and who her people were, telling him that humans were an Isu creation that went south due to the aforementioned rebellion. She told him of a great catastrophe that effectively decimated the Isu during their time, and that this catastrophe this cataclysm was set to occur again. She tells Desmond to find the Grand Temple so that this can be averted. Desmond was pulled out of the Animus, being told Abstergo had found them and that they were attacking. Using a hidden blade that Lucy got from... I don't know, probably wherever Cleopatra got hers. Anyway, after fighting off some Abstergo guards and Warren's plans to reclaim Desmond were effectively crushed, he fled, as did the assassins heading to the Villa Auditore in Monteregione, the ancestral home of the Auditore, and used it as a base to hide from the Templars and continue looking for the apple by reliving the memories of Ezio Auditore. Whilst opening the door to the sanctuary, Desmond saw three numbers over a triangle using eagle vision. 1419, 1420, and 1421. Although the assassins Assassins didn't exactly have a conclusive answer to what this meant just yet. Much like his previous Animus sessions with Ezio, Desmond found multiple messages from Subject 16, this time in the form of rifts as opposed to glyphs. After decoding all of them, Desmond met Clay. As I mentioned before, Clay managed to imprint himself into the Animus before his death, and he told Desmond of many things. Eve, the son, his son, all before disappearing. Compiling subsystems. Infrastructure. 
tendons. Heart. Voice. Check 16. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes. Subject 17. You're dead. I saw your blood. No time. It is far later than you know. Too late to save them. Who? She is not who you think she is. Everything you hope to become, everything you hold dear, it's already gone. Explain. Please. Eden. She... In Eden, find Eve. The key, her DNA. Tell me. I cannot. The son. Your son. Too weak. Must replenish energy. Don't go! I am with you till the end. Find me in the darkness. After going through seven years of Ezio's memories in the coming days, watching him lose Monterigioni and Mario only to topple the Borgia and become a mentor with an army of assassins at his back, he learned that he left the apple under the Colosseum. The only thing they didn't have was a password, which luckily enough, Sean figured out. The symbol matches the one on the door to the vault. 1419, 1420, 1421. What if they aren't dates? 1419, 1420. Oh my god. What? God! Tell us already! I am, I am, I am! The Tetragrammaton, the 72 names of God, you see? They're all contained within three verses, Exodus 19 through 21. And get this, you'll like this, if you arrange the four Hebrew letters in God's name within an equilateral triangle, their numerical values add up to the same number. 72. Are you absolutely sure about this? That's kind of why I'm saying it out loud, Rebecca, yeah, but I haven't got to the kicker yet. Construction on the Colosseum began in the year 72. I think we have our password. Sean, go get the van. The assassins finally have it, the apple, but Desmond's very presence sets it off, freezing everyone. In that moment, none of them could move. And just then, Juno spoke to him. I know that symbol. That, that's a Phrygian cap. It stands for the freedom, and that, that's a Masonic eye. Now those two come together in only one place. What's that? I, I can't move. Your DNA communes with the apple. You have activated it. Let me go! On the 72nd day before the moment of awakening, you, birthed from our loins and the loins of our enemies, the end and the beginning, who we abhor and honor, the final journey commences. There is one who would accompany you through the gate. She lies not within our sight. The cross darkens the horizon. Doing. The path must be opened. You cannot escape your part in this. The scales shall be balanced. Stop! Please! You know very little. We must guide you. Cease your struggle. No! It is done. The way lies all before you. Only she remains to be found. Awaken the sixth. Go alone! The Apple communicated with Desmond and showed him what would happen, who Lucy was, and in this alternate timeline that never came to be, the satellite launch failed anyway. I killed her, you know. I killed Lucy. It was the Apple, son. It was Juno. I saw what she was. What would happen if I let her live? I could have stopped myself. I mean, there was a force there, but I didn't have to. I chose to. Desmond. Lucy was going to betray us and take the apple back to Abstergo. I saw the satellite launched. I saw them turn it on and then... 
It failed. After killing Lucy, Desmond passed out and was taken away by the assassins. At some point, Sean and Rebecca met back up with William Miles, who put Desmond back in the Animus, with this version of the Animus also working as sort of life support. And Desmond awoke in a dark grey place, the one that Clay had mentioned, and upon exploring this weird island, Desmond came across 16. Just walk right past me. 16? No, they didn't tell you my name. Oh, God damn it, I'm still in the Animus? Quite a shock. Something out there. Rebecca, get me out of here. They can't help you, Desmond. You're a broken man. Your mind, it's... broken. Broken? I feel fine. So did I. Hey. <laughs> Look at me now! Let's talk, buddy. Walk with me. What is this place? It's nice, isn't it? We're in the guts of the Animus. The original test program. No memories here, just basic physics, weather simulations. Hello, world. You're lucky someone up there had the sense to plug you in here. It saved your life. Saved it from what? Right now, you should be sitting in a hospital room, drooling and chewing on your tongue. For now, the Animus is keeping you intact. Keeping all your ancestors from collapsing into one big mess. But if you can't find a sync nexus, all those personalities will smash together. And that won't be pretty. A sync nexus? I'm getting there. Hold on. There. That thing is your way out. You're screwing with me. Here's the problem. Your brain is hash. Too many ghosts in your head, too many voices. So how do you fix that? You claw your way back into the stored data, you find unfinished memories, and you crack them open. Finish what you started, until your ancestor has nothing left to show you. That is a sync nexus. And when you find it, the Animus can separate Desmond from Ezio and Altair and send you home. Back to your body. How do you know all this? Because it happened to me. But my body, it's worm food now. So I'm stuck here. A word of warning, when you step through there, everything changes, nothing feels normal. And so one last time, Desmond began reliving the memories of Ezio de Torre and Altier Ibn Ahad so he could reach the Sync Nexus. And after reaching this Sync Nexus, Desmond came across the Isu Jupiter. Ah, there you are. Good. A strange place, this Nexus of Time. I am not used to the calculations. That has always been Minerva's domain. I see you still have many questions. Who were we? What became of us? What do we desire of you? You will have your answers. Only listen, and I will tell you how. Both before the end and after, we sought to save the world. We built vaults within which to work, each dedicated to a different method of salvation. They were placed underground to avoid the war which raged above, and also as a precaution should we fail in our efforts. Each vault's knowledge was transmitted to a single place. It was our duty, mine, Minerva's, and Juno's, to sort and sample all that was collected. We chose those solutions which held the most promise and devoted ourselves to testing their merits. Six we tried in succession, each more encouraging than the last, but none worked. And then the world ended.
The earth shook for days, the fires burned for weeks, and when the ash had settled, less than 10,000 of your kind still lived, and far fewer of ours. But we carried on, together, to rebuild, to renew. Listen, you must go there, to the place where we labored, labored and lost. Take my words, pass them from your head into your hands. That is how you will open the way. But be warned, much still remains in flux, and I do not know how things will end either in my time or yours. Seeing the Toba catastrophe and knowing what awaited the Earth, Desmond told the assassins he knew what to do. After heeding Juno's warning, they headed to the Grand Temple, which was under a small village called Turin in New York. The apple would open the temple, however, there was another door further inside that needed a key to be opened, one in the form of a necklace. Desmond initially followed the memories of his ancestor, the British Templar Haytham Kenway, in the colonies in the 18th century. He soon learned that Haytham's son, Radun Hagaden, or at Hangerton, or whatever Noah Watt's name of choice was that day. Sorry, it still really annoys me. Also known as Connor, simply, he held the key. In between Animus sessions, Juno would tell Desmond more about the ones who came before, such as her husband, Aita, a fellow Isu scientist notable for the building of the observatory. She told Desmond how he was used as an experiment to see if the Isu could have their consciousness placed into an artificial body. This was one of the six methods of salvation, various last ditch efforts the Isu had to try and save themselves from the catastrophe, but of course, none of them were successful. When the experiment failed and Aita faced a certain death, Juno implanted a trigger into the human genome so that at random, in very rare cases, certain individuals called sages would take on Aita's memories, and oftentimes his personality and dedication to Juno, although not always. Desmond also took breaks to find power sources to keep the temple powered up. In one of these, he came across Daniel Cross, a Templar who was previously Subject 4, captured by the Templars and forced to relive the memories of his ancestor at only nine years old. Cross suffered from the bleeding effect severely, and often confused himself for his ancestor, a Russian assassin. One time, William Miles went searching for another power source in Cairo. He was captured by Abstergo and held in the exact facility where Desmond was only weeks before. Daniel Cross was there, and when met with the apple, it triggered the bleeding effect causing him to flee, leaving him defenceless for Desmond to kill him. Desmond made his way up to Vidic to see him standing over William with multiple guards pointing guns at him. Vidic asked one last time for the apple, and I really... I really don't know what he thought was going to happen here, to be honest with you. Dad? Not so fast, Mr. Miles. In case you hadn't noticed, I'm the one calling the shots. Now give me the apple. You want it? Fine. Here it is. Wait! No! never should have come here. You put everything on the line. For what? So you could rescue your father? Yeah. With William and the apple secured, Desmond continued to relive Connor's memories until the key was found. It was in the grave of Connor's mentor's son, Connor Davenport, just outside the Davenport homestead in Massachusetts only the next day over. The team retrieved the key and headed into the depths of the Grand Temple. Upon arriving, the assassins came across Juno, stood by a large orb mounted upon a pedestal. She told him that if Desmond only touched it, the disaster wouldn't strike the earth. When suddenly, Minerva appeared, telling Desmond that the reason Juno was locked in the temple was because she used technology like this to try and rule the world, and would surely try again. He was left with two choices, to let humanity face a horrible disaster that would nearly wipe them out, free of Juno's control, or die to save humanity, leaving Juno to try and take over the world. Minerva used the eye to show him what would be, and try and sway him. You heed Minerva, the sun will have its way. The ground will crack and spit fire into the skies. All the world will burn. But this does not end the world. 
merely heralds its arrival. Darkness follows. Then you emerge, resolving to lay a foundation that such a tragedy does not befall the world again. You will become a symbol to those who survive. Hope, knowledge, determination. You will inspire them to rebuild, to thrive once more. And as the world heals, so too will humanity. But you are just a man, frail and mortal. You pass from the world, leaving behind only a memory, a legacy. You will be remembered first as a hero, later as a legend, and in time, as a god. It is the cruelest fate to have written words that meant well, and see them made wicked and unwise. What was meant to encourage life, used instead to justify taking it. And so now you see that what was shall be again. So tell me, how is this better? Despite this, Desmond decided he'd do it. He'd free Juno and let the world be. To him, it was better a world with a glimpse of hope where it was still possible to beat Juno and come out victorious, rather than one that was so hopeless and desolate. He said goodbye to his father, Rebecca and Sean, and then made a decision that would change the course of humanity. Sacrifice you, sacrifice the world, for no other reason than to deny me vindication. They will enslave your kind, Desmond. Is this not why you fight? Is this not why you came here? To ensure more than just your race's future, but its freedom? What future? What freedom? Billions dead and the whole cycle begun anew? This world has known nothing but heartache and horror since we left it. Our gift to them, and you'd see it all returned. Enough! You must not do this. Whatever Juno's planning, however terrible it might seem today, we'll find a way to stop it. But the alternative, what you want, there's no hope there. If you free her, you'll be destroyed. It will happen in an instant. There will be no pain. You mustn't. It's done, Minerva. The decision's made. Then the consequences of this mistake are yours to live and to die with. You need to go. All of you. Now. Get as far away from here as you can. Come with us! We'll find another way! There isn't time. Son. You know it's true. It's already started. I need to do this now. So go. Go! Some sort of global aurora borealis. Never seen anything like this before. Eyewitnesses describe electrical storms and erratic displays of unusual weather. Residents are being asked to remain inside and wait for geological surveys are now reporting. Hours later, an Abstergo team found and dissected Desmond's body, taking every piece of DNA they possibly could. As Ivo Grammatica later described it, they stripped him for parts there and then. His DNA was then used by Abstergo's entertainment sect in the Sample 17 project. The goal of Abstergo Entertainment was to use the genetic memories of various subjects to find interesting settings for video games. They then used that money to fund the Templars. One employee, who was particularly interesting, characterised and well-developed, was tasked with reliving the memories 
memories of Hytham's father and Connor's grandfather, the English Welsh assassin Edward Kenway, following his pursuit of the observatory. And as I mentioned before, this was built by the Isu Aita, and its function was to survey anyone the Isu wanted. As it turned out, an IT employee at Abstergo, John Standish, was an aforementioned sage, a reincarnation of Aita who was sent to Abstergo as a double agent for the assassins, who wanted to use him to figure out what exactly happened to Desmond. But in reality, he was a member of the Instruments of the First Will, a cult dedicated to Juno and her revival, not loyal to the assassins or the Templars, and his plan was to use the resources of Abstergo to revive Juno from the grave, though he was stopped in his tracks and shot dead whilst trying to channel Juno's consciousness into the body of one of the employees, reliving the memories of Edward Kenway. Standish's body was used by Dr. Ivo Grammatica to launch the Phoenix Project, which was effectively the use of the DNA of sages to sequence their rare triple helix genome, allowing them insight into how exactly they were so advanced, with the end goal being to create an Isu. After realising what was going on, a group of assassins, including Sean Hastings and Galena Voronina, attacked the Paris facility where the Phoenix Project was taking place, destroying the body of John Standish as well as one of the Shrouds of Eden. And this was the Shroud which housed the consciousness of Consus, another Isu. It was around this time that Otso Berg, leader of Sigma Team, effectively Abstergo's own private military, began using another analyst at Abstergo to look into the memories of Shay Patrick Cormac. Happened in Haiti, happened in Portugal. A great earthquake, thousands dead next to your damned manuscript. Get him out of here. I want them to know how weak they truly are, and I want everyone to see them suffer. So on the day they finally meet me, they will welcome the death I offer them. She was right. What would he know? More than me, apparently. My plan is in motion. I have no further demand to place upon you. However, Shay's story is not complete. I would ask that you see it through to the end. Berg sent footage of Shay's Templar activities to the assassins as sort of a, a middle finger, I guess. I don't exactly see that being like a top priority as a military leader and part of the inner sanctum, which basically puts you on like the highest of rungs for the Templars, but like each for their own, I guess. Also that year, the assassin Bishop reached out to the Helix user, you, yes you, compelling Assassin's Creed character, you, who was playing these Abstergo video games, going through the tampered memories of a Templar working with Jacques de Molay. Bishop told the initiate of how Abstergo was manipulating these memories, and also about the Phoenix Project, requesting that the initiate relive the memories of Arno Victor Dorian so they could find the Sage Francois Thomas Chaman before Abstergo could, who would surely use him to progress with the project, although his corpse had decomposed to the point where it was effectively useless. The next year, the initiate would team up with Bishop, Rebecca and Sean to track one of the Shrouds of Eden, an Isu artifact notable for its incredible regenerative powers. The assassins discovered the Shroud was under Buckingham Palace after reliving the memories of twin assassins Jacob and Evie Fry. Galena, Sean and Rebecca arrived to collect the Shroud, however so would Otso Berg, as well as fellow Templars Violet da Costa, a member of Sigma Team, and Isabel Ardant, head of historical research at Abstergo. The two groups fought, with Sean killing Ardant and Violet shooting Rebecca, Rebecca survived and the only person to die that night was Isabella Dunt. In the heat of battle, Da Costa escaped with the Shroud, bringing it back to Grammatica's lap. He intended to use the Shroud to create a member of the Isu. However, when he left, it was revealed that Violet was a member of the Instruments of the First Will, who intended to help Juno rule humanity. Hence why she was locked away in the Grand Temple, because that has always been her grand plan. And I did forget to mention that the Isu created humans essentially to use them as slave labour, you know, that little chestnut is why she felt a little bit entitled to that, but the other two members of the triad simply weren't happy. Hello? It's me? Brought the shroud as you asked, but I'm scared. Do not fear me. You've done well. 
I'm not scared of you. I'm scared for you. Anyone finds out what you've been doing. You have played your part, my instrument. I will save you. I will save you all. In 2017, Abstergo sent a member of the historical tactical team, Layla Hassan, to the Qatara Depression in Egypt to find a piece of Eden valuable to the Templars. Previously, Layla had somehow managed to develop an animus that was able to read the DNA of people unrelated to her, and that was also able to decipher severely damaged DNA. It's not really explained at all, but she wanted to prove herself to Abstergo that she was more than just your average employee. So when she and her employed girlfriend Diana Geary were sent to retrieve this artifact, Fact, she found the tombs of Bayek and Aya, which is when Layla decided to use her portable animus, which I guess she was just carrying about, to relive their memories. Both of them were founding members of the Hidden Ones, an early form of the assassins that would later bridge into the Levantines. During her time reliving their memories, Sigma Team investigated what exactly was going on because Layla hadn't reported back to Abstergo. They killed Diana and attempted to kill Layla, who was able to defend herself. After killing members of Sigma Team, she effectively made herself an enemy of Abstergo. Oh, D? Oh, D. No, no, no. Later on, the assassin William Miles turned up and asked this Abstergo employee, there and then, to join the assassins, alongside, you know, this Otso Berg tear plastic surgery he's had. He's, he's also, like, suffered a severe brain injury in the last five years, and all this game isn't very well written. I'll, I'll just let you decide. In the coming months, as Layla worked as an assassin, Desmond's illegitimate son, Elijah Miles, was being used by the instruments of the First Will. A few years earlier, he was captured by Abstergo as his mother had him taken into one of their clinics, only to discover he shared Subject 17's DNA. And not just that, he was a sage. Isabel, what brings you here? I came to gloat, actually. Look at this data. A sage? It gets better. Check his patrilineal line. Let's see, patrilineal line, 19th century American Midwest, 18th century American Revolution, 16th century Ottoman Empire, 15th century Italian Renaissance. Oh my God, you don't mean? Yeah, the best part, his mother just walked him into one of your new clinics in New York City. Oh, I'd really like to strip him for parts like we did with Subject 17. Oh, no, you don't. You had your chance with the Shroud. This asset is mine, and I won't be a party to the needless mutilation of a ten-year-old boy. It's inhumane. So what do you plan to do with him? Given his unique lineage, I think we should put him into an animus for the next 50 years. Think of the data we could extract. That's terribly old-fashioned. In any case, we should send Sigma Team to recover him. No. I'm going to keep an eye on him for now. We'll collect him when the time is right. In August 2018, the instruments broke into Grammatica's lap, forcing him to use Elijah's DNA to reincarnate Juno into a human body, and while this was successful, the assassin Charlotte Day Cruz pretty quickly killed her, and then Elijah presumably escaped into the Australian desert. Yes, the main antagonist of Assassin's Creed was killed in a comic you've probably never heard of, by a character you've probably never heard of, but it's okay, because that year, as an apology from Ubisoft, we got Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Hold. You'll have to be stronger than that. In Odyssey, Layla is searching for more ESO artifacts with the assassins, and the one she's after is the Spear of Leonidas, which for the record is capable of anything. She just finds it at the start of the game. Cool. But a wrench is thrown into the works, right? When there's two DNA samples found on the spear. So the animus, this animus, that's meant to be able to read damaged DNA specifically, instead of letting you relive either of the samples as it should working up a fixed history, as the Animus does, creates two alternate timelines, in which there are literally millions more alternate timelines, because the DNA is apparently too damaged, despite the fact that shatters some of the first dialogue you ever hear in the series, and no, it's not too old, because Clay relives the memories of Adam and Eve, which are 35 times older, on a much more dated version of the Animus. This essentially destroys crucial lore, lore that was embedded in the Ten Commandments the series should follow a decade ago, all to make a game more marketable to a casual audience, fucking off long-time fans and what the franchise actually was, all to have two hollow nothings poorly act and fuck their way through ancient Greece, all while repeatedly saying, Malaka, because that 
that's how you write a good character. Not like your choices have any consequence in the game. Even if they did, the novel sets a clear canon in stone, so unless you play the game very linearly, you pick one character and emulate the book, your choices are inaccurate and devalidated. And if you do, the game caters to every possible choice, making the protagonist nothing and everything at the same time, at the cost of what little narrative integrity this series had left. Like, I meant for this video to be an objective timeline, but at a point, the series writing takes a total nosedive, with Odyssey being a notable example. And I can't... I can't just talk my way through this plot as if it makes any sense, or is on the same tier as what came before. Like, this game is just astoundingly, mind-bogglingly sh- Layla later meets Cassandra wearing a suit, who is alive due to the effects of the Staff of Hermes, which grants immortality to its wielder. She tells Layla that she is the one who will bring balance to the Force and hands her the Snaff, dying in the process. The last time we see Layla is in the fates of Atlantis DLC, where she's guided through Atlantis by the Isu Aletheia, and she's seemingly corrupted by all that power, killing her friend Victoria, and she later faces off with Otto Berg, who is now a Greek mercenary NPC, apparently. Okay. Uh, she presumably paralyzes him, but it's it's like made a point of that he's still alive. And that is pretty much where we're at. I know Odyssey was a bit of a low point, but Van Halen's lead writer, he's Darby McDevitt, can't sing his praises enough. He's the best writer this series has ever seen. He wrote Revelations and Black Flag and Embers, as I said in the intro. And that is the main thing that's got me hyped for Valhalla, because I know he'll knock it out of the park at the very least. There's some stuff I didn't include, like stuff from the comics and the film, but that's because this is purely a recap of the mainline story, and there is tons of transmedia and, like, a ton of stuff in Assassin's Creed really doesn't matter to, like, the overarching story. Like, there is a ridiculous amount to burn through, but yeah. Anyway, if you enjoyed, maybe leave a like, and if you didn't, maybe let me know why. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time in another Assassin's Creed video.